this afternoon, as congregation, you have come to the doctrine of the Word of God as it is summed up in Lord's Day 41 about the seventh commandment. Now, before we read Lord's Day 41, it's always good to remind ourselves of the actual commandment, and I always like to read the, uh, the preamble to the law, which always impresses upon us that the law comes in the context of grace. It comes to a people who have been set free. So, just to read the preamble again, God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then the seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. And in Lord's Day 47, we confess as follows, what does the seventh commandment teach us? That all unchastity is cursed by God. We must therefore detest it from the heart and live chaste and disciplined lives both within and outside of holy marriage. Does God in this commandment forbid nothing more than adultery and similar shameful sins? Since we, body and soul, are temples of the Holy Spirit, it is God's will that we keep ourselves pure and holy. Therefore, He forbids all unchaste acts, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever may entice us to unchastity. Beloved brothers and sisters in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, so this afternoon we come to the seventh commandment. It is one of the laws given by our gracious God to preserve us in the freedom, not just freedom from bondage to Pharaoh and Egypt, but bondage to Satan and sin through the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if in the strict sense, in the narrowest sense, you could say the sixth commandment teaches us our duties with respect to our neighbor's life. In the seventh commandment, in the strict sense, the Lord teaches the duties towards a neighbor's wife. Of course, while the wording speaks of the commandment or speaks about a man therefore having a sexual relations with the wife of another, a very specific sin, really what we have, and that's typical for the commandments, you have the most blatant example of a whole category of sins. Really, this is the most blatant example of sexual sin. And so, as the Sixth Commandment easily is expanded to all the different aspects of life, life, physical life, life in its relationships, you could say that the Seventh Commandment is very easily also expanded to deal with all the different aspects of sexuality, also marriage. Now, while it may be a popular notion in our time due to a saying by a former prime minister that the government has no business in the bedrooms of the nation, and, and we get to hear it all the time that as long as something is done by two consenting adults, no one has a right to say anything about that, we realize that, that God does not accept that reasoning. In our reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul addressed various matters relating to sexual conduct, he brings out that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And he adds that we are not our own, but we were bought with a price. We were bought with the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he has a lot to say to us about what we do in our bodies, what we do, you could say, also in our bedrooms. Everywhere we are called to glorify God. Now, this afternoon, then, we will listen to what our Heavenly Father teaches us about marriage and about sexuality. He is not hush-hush about these things, but actually, rather, you could say He is embarrassingly open. But as we listen, then we discover that He is not puritanical, which can be very narrow-minded and kind of make it very, look very evil to talk about these kind of things. No, but He does call for purity. And also by this statute, His purpose is to show us how to live in that new freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, so that His name will be glorified for our own assurance of salvation as well as for our neighbor's benefit. You, you recall those three points from Lord's Day 32 as to why must we do good works. Now, therefore, I proclaim to you this afternoon 
In the seventh commandment, our Father teaches us His kingdom standard for sexual purity. And we consider three things. First of all, His abhorrence of the ways of the nations. Secondly, His kingdom's pattern as learned from creation. And then finally, His compassionate counsel concerning sexual temptation. So, in the seventh commandment, our Father teaches us His kingdom standard for sexual purity. And then we begin in the first place by speaking about our Father's abhorrence for the way of the nations. And as you think about Scripture, you know, you learn, yes, sin is sin. And you break one commandment, you break all the commandments. It is really hard to think of different kind of sins, except you could say sin against the first commandment, rejecting God. But sin, you could say, against the second part of the law, where we see any greater displeasure shown by the Lord than sins against the seventh commandment. Now, the catechism, of course, refers to sexual sins as unchastity, and it says there that they are cursed by God. And in that respect, sexual sins have, have played a very large role in situations that led to, you could say, the greatest displays of the Lord's displeasure over sin, over man living in rebellion against Him. And as I say that, of course, right away, your mind begins to th run through examples of Scripture, and you will undoubtedly think of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. We have the description, of course, in, in the book of Genesis, but the way that actually Jude sums it up in his letter, he very succinctly says that they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. That's how he captured what was going on over there. Those are sexual sins. It was very evident also when those two angels who were in the form of men came to visit Lot and his family, and really they wanted to rape those men. But that was reflective of the whole mindset toward sexuality, not only that they wanted to have sex with whoever came there, but also that they had that, that unnatural desire. And the Lord didn't say, well, if that's what they like to do in Sodom, that's just left between two consenting adults. No, He didn't think it was the people's personal right to decide how to do it. He showed it was very wrong. And we know that story very well. The children will have learned that, that, that the Lord in His wrath over the terrible sin, he, he rained fire and brimstone down from heaven upon the cities, and He turned those cities upside down. So when first Lot had moved there, he saw this beautiful valley, just like the Garden of Eden. It must have been very fertile, flourishing. But He turned it upside down, and it became the Dead Sea, which is a testimony to the dead end of such wickedness. The Lord showed His strong displeasure. Now, the situation in the world was not much different when Israel was set free from Egypt some 400 years later. The Lord had to warn His people against the sexual practices of the nations where they had left Egypt, where they were going. And so, you get Him even specific. And again, here we see how, how the Word is so to the point. God is not hush-hush. But, for example, Leviticus 18, that's almost, you could say, too embarrassing a chapter to lead, read out loud in a worship service. But still, if you read that for yourself later on, you see all kind of specific things, sexual sins mentioned, sex with family members, incest is condemned, sex with animals, homosexual relations. And then in that chapter, as Moses lists all kind of perversity, then also he instructed the people saying, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these things the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall do none of these abominations, lest the land vomit you out." Now, as you hear that, you know, you may recall that, that the Lord kind of delayed giving Abraham and his descendants the promised land because He says, well, I'm still patient with them. The measure of their sins are not yet full. Well, by the time the Exodus came, the measure of those sins were full. The Lord had had enough of the increasing perversity, and then He sent really, 
the people of Israel to be His instruments and to turn the land of Canaan upside down. Not to turn it into a dead sea, but they were to exterminate all the people. Yes, in that particular case, the Lord basically said, well, there has to be genocide because these people have gotten so perverse, they need to be punished. They were to be His instruments. But even the way that also it is said that, that the land vomited out these people. These sins were so despicable in the Lord's sight, He could not stand them. But He says even, even the land, which we think of as an inanimate thing, the land couldn't take it anymore. And, and the whole idea of vomiting, you know, that happens sometimes when you get an upset stomach. That's not a pretty picture. Well, the land couldn't take it anymore. Get rid of these people because of the, their despicable behavior in the sight of God. Now, while all these, these situations, they point to the Lord abhorring sexual perversity, we, we should recognize that, you know, ju don't just focus on terrible kind of sexual sins, but the Lord also abhors marriage break up. When someone breaks their vows, I understand that Reverend Luke has been preaching through Malachi, so you will have also been reminded of his chastisement. And that was interesting in Malachi where he especially chastised the priests, the priests who should have been giving leadership also in their faithfulness in their marriage. But he says, well, you're breaking your marriage vows, the covenant with the wife of your youth. And the Lord considered that despicable. So it wasn't even, you could say, terrible sexual sins, although bound to involve adultery sooner or later, but the breaking of marriage vows. The Lord Jesus also reinforces that in Matthew 19 when it says that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. It's good to highlight this because, you know, also again under the pressures of society, even though we know divorce is wrong, somehow it has become a more acceptable sin. And we get more upset about all the other perversities, but when the Lord says, no, that's also very wrong. That's not how I made things in the beginning. Now, the, the abhorrence of sexual sins is also heard in the teachings of the Apostle Paul, as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. We read, for example, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. You know, those are powerful words. And maybe in this world, people have come to the point that they say, well, you can't tell us what to do. But the Lord indeed can say, well, okay, that's what you want to do. I can't stop you, you could say, in this life. But let it be known for one thing very clearly. That if you do those kind of things and you do not repent from them, and, and some in Corinth had repented, they were now church members, but if you do not repent from them, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't deceive yourselves. And the final passage I draw your attention to is Romans chapter 1. For Paul writes, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. It's contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now, the way that Paul expresses it there in Romans chapter 1, that, that brings out that not only does such kind of behavior evoke God's righteous wrath, as we saw Sodom and Gomorrah, saw it in the land of Canaan, but the way he puts it there, such behavior actually shows that people are being punished by God for having abandoned God. When you let go of God, then God lets so go of the people that everything gets turned upside down. And this makes us realize that what we are witnessing in our country, you could say in the whole Western society, is God is, is, is feeling God's abhorrence as, as, as punishment for turning its back on Him. It's not that we can simply say, well, God must be very upset with these people. Yes, He's upset, but He has 
responded also to Western society abandoning God and says, okay, then I give you over to your own filth, to your own perversity, and go wallow in the mud. If you want to live that way without me, then become basically inhuman in your conduct. And we see that, you know, that, that God in a sense has given over Western society to its own deadliness and, and, and let these kind of sins proliferate. We add to that how also we live in a society where there is no respect for life. People hate their own children. They have the, the, the abortion, the murder of infants. And then you know that, that sometimes people in politics, they, they want to kind of promote their cause and they want to cry out, well, God bless Canada. We have to be so careful. We should always pray for our nation. But really, we have to pray that the Lord will lead people to repentance, will lead our leaders to repentance, so they will not continue to, to take the lead and rush, rushing headlong further into the way of destruction. But in the, note well, these are indications of the displeasure of the Lord over abandoning the service of His name. Now we need to be reminded of our Father's abhorrence, because if we don't get those reminders, you know, then we are in danger of the proverbial frog in the pan of water. You may have, you may have heard that example somewhere. You know, a, a frog is a cold-blooded animal that does not sense temperature change. So, if you put him in a pot of water, you know, the frog will be happily swimming around, maybe back float a little bit, but then you turn up the heat. The frog does not notice. But, you know, sooner or later, that frog is going to be a boiled frog. And it happened to him, he didn't even realize it because he doesn't have the, the temperature sensors that, that we have and we respond to heat and cold. Well, you see, we, we should be careful because the world is kind of slowly warming up in wickedness and perversity. That doesn't happen overnight. You know, if you, if you think about it, the generation 50 years ago, and they heard about certain sexual sins and said, oh, oh terrible. But now, we are so used to it. Yeah, we know it's terrible, but we don't go so quickly say, oh, that's terrible anymore. So, we kind of get, get acclimatized. We know it's wrong, but the abhorrence begins to diminish. And so, it's important to be warned and to be reminded this is how the Lord looks at those things. And if, if we are, are not warned then we're going to indeed slowly be boiled to death, taken up into this whole kind of mindset that we're going to come to the point also of like Lot's wife. She liked the life there in that city. And yes, she must have thought things weren't all right, but, but yet while well, the Lord, well, the angel says, go run, don't look back, she ran, but then she looked back because life was just too nice over there. What if the Lord told us, go run, my people, run away from, from Brampton. Run away because I'm going to turn it upside down. Could we at this moment get up, start running, running wherever the Lord's directed us, not look back to all the things that we have acquired perhaps in a lifetime of hard work and diligent saving? Could we run just like that, or, or are we too attracted to the ways of the world? It's important to think about that, to be reminded of how the Lord looks at those things. Now, what we see then in the world is how sexuality and marriage should not be, and how it should be, and how it pleases God. Well, we learn that from creation. That's our second point. Now, indeed, we have to turn to creation, because there we, we see human sexuality and marriage in its pure, unspoiled state. And when we do that, you know, when you think of the opening chapters of, of Genesis, first two chapters, then you see how, how human sexuality and marriage is, is part of God's good creation, and, and you could say it is, it is kind of celebrated. We hear it in a way that on the sixth day God created man, male and female He made them, so that's the two genders. That, that implies already sexuality, sexual differences. And then he told our first parents, be fruitful and multiply. Well, brothers and sisters, if you haven't told your children yet, that requires sexual relations. And your children would not be here if there had not been sexual relations. And there's nothing to be ashamed about. 
That's the way God made things in the beginning. And, and even if you have not told them that, the, the children, if you've read Genesis 1 and 2, they probably figured that out by just listening to what is being told over there. And to listening, whenever so-and-so knew his wife, oh, they had children. That's how it goes. That's how God made things. And you can also see this celebration of the marriage relationship when, when you think of when Adam then also gets Eve, the Lord kind of takes him through an educational process. You know, in chapter 2, we learn that actually God did not make Adam and Eve at the same time. He first made Adam. He gave him the exercise of naming all the animals, and also he realizes they have a partner. I don't. I'm alone. And, and that was kind of a teaching method for Adam also to realize that he was not yet complete. And so then the Lord God completed his creation process, and he gave Adam his wife. To go on of his ribs, formed her into a woman. But then if you think of, of Adam waking up from sleep, and then he saw Eve. Try to picture that, you know. He was just overcome with joy. Did it ever strike you, brothers and sisters, that the first human words recorded ever, first human words recorded in Scripture, are Adam's words in response to seeing his wife. It's like his marriage song. Here at last is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. She was taken from man, she shall be called woman. A little poem too yet. Her first father was a poet. And what did he make a poem about? Love love and marriage. He was just overcome with joy. And then we see them also in that harmony. They lived naked with no shame. Can't do that now. You know, if the whole congregation said here naked, that just would not work. We live in a broken world. But that's how it was in the beginning. So, there we, we see that beautiful picture also. And then at the conclusion of that particular passage, you know, it says that a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's evident that this is the pattern for mankind. For God made the man and the woman like two pieces of a puzzle that perfectly fit together, and it's all part of the good creation. There's no shame. I just said that very openly, part of the good creation. Now, we do well to note how the opening pages of the Bible then give direction for human sexuality. It belongs in marriage. And marriage is rather obviously a relationship between a man and a woman. Any child can figure that out. Just read the Bible. It's very clear. Children are brought forth with the blessing of the Lord. And also, there was that sexual relation between a husband and wife. And also in those first chapters is the answer for every young person to the question, now, but what is wrong with premarital sex? Why must a couple wait till they are married? Well, the answer is, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and there they can enjoy the one flesh relationship. It's all laid out just like that, very clearly in the opening chapters of Genesis. Now, we're not quite done with the first point. We're just going, the second point, we're going to see also some places where this message is reinforced, even though it is further in Scripture. But you can say there are kind of echoes of what happened in creation. If you think about the Lord also told His people at Mount Sinai when He had to address His people in a fallen world, then, then really, when he forbids adultery, when he forbids all the other sexual sins, really what he's doing is he's telling his children, now you're free from, from Egypt. Don't do the things they did there. You're going to Canaan. Don't do the things there. Basically, the laws that the Lord gave to his people enabled them to relive how it had been in creation. And so, there is to be marriage, and there is to be also the having children within the marriage bond. Because within, within the marriage bond, you can say marriage is like the garden where the flower of sex can flourish. Now, we find some rather explicit instructions about the joy of sexual relations within the marriage bond in a book like Proverbs. You know, we, we read a few verses of that book. It's not the only place, a few other passages. And again, in, amidst the warnings against unchastity, you know, we, we heard words like, drink water from your own cistern, 
flowing water from your own well. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. I don't know how, how wives would receive it today if husbands speak to them or maybe in the past when since maybe some, some people are widows or widowers. If, I don't think you really speak that way to each other in our current setting, but, but you get the imagery, different time period, but that's how they talked about it, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Pretty plain talk. You know, when you read that, you might, as parents almost think, I don't know whether I can let my child have their own Bible because they might read passages like that. That's good because that's what the Lord is teaching youth, that they should aim for this also within their life. He's teaching young men. He's teaching young husbands these kind of things. And then we think of the Song of Songs, a book that tends to embarrass us with its explicit talk about two people crazily in love with one another. And it was all good. You see, that's an echo, an echo of what it was like in paradise. Now, by looking to a creation, then we gain an understanding of sexual purity. For sexual relations belong in the bond that is established between husband and a wife, a man and a woman, the marriage covenant that binds the two people together. It's meant to be a permanent bond until death. And there, there are all these things, all human sexuality can, can flourish and be fruitful under the blessing of our Heavenly Father. And He will even use that, that bond to, to raise the next generation of His children because, of course, He can gather people from everywhere, and He does that. He's gracious. He gathers people to Himself, but also of His children that come to Him. He says, your children that are dear to you, they are dear to Me. Covenant children. Beautiful that He does that. Again, it shows how beautiful the Lord considers the marriage relationship. The children born from us are special to Him. Now, outside of that bond… Indeed, people may engage in sexual relations. They do that, and it may give them satisfaction, you could say, but it's only satisfying the human flesh, and it will bring the curse of God already in this life because you cannot mock the living God and think you'll get away with it. Now, at the same time, to protect His children in this fallen world, our Heavenly Father gives compassionate counsel concerning sexual temptation. You know, you could say, well, this part of the sermon wouldn't have been necessary if we still lived in paradise, but we don't live in paradise. We live in a broken world where we are redeemed people and restored, but we need this counsel to be able to live in a proper, chaste way. Now, as we think about His compassionate counsel, in the first place, we repeatedly hear the call to self-control. You know, for example, in, in Titus 2 for 6, well, that points to, to the control of sexual urges. Because, you know, we should not follow the ways of the world where they think, well, I feel like doing certain things, therefore I have to do it and I have a right to do it. No, God's children are not to be driven by the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's a reminder that as Christians, you know, we are not ruled by our hormones, but we are ruled by the Holy Spirit whose temples we are. And this also may require because, you know, the hormones, yes, that's part of the way we are, but the hormones have been affected by the way of sin. So, so when the hormones pull us in the wrong direction, then we, then we have to say that's not the way of the Spirit. And we have to walk away from tempting situations. Maybe that means turning off electronic devices because they seem to be avenues into all kind of tempta sexual temptations. Or there may be situations like Joseph where the temptation comes our way and the only thing to do is to run. Just run as fast as you can. Physically get out of the situation. Now, in the second place, there is the instruction Paul gives to the Corinthians that it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. Always sounds a little bit on the, the crass side. Is that the reason you got married? Aren't you supposed to love someone? 
But, but you see, we have to understand also Paul's instruction there. He was addressing the Corinthians. And when you kind of put that whole picture together, then you kind of get the impression that some of the Corinthians were thinking, well, we are now redeemed. And that means great spiritual benefits, but that did not really seem to think it all through in terms of what it meant for the body, but also to the point that they thought, well, perhaps as Christians, we are almost like in the new heaven and new earth. We don't really have to worry about marriage anymore. So, uh, perhaps they could start to say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're mature Christians, and we can stay single, and we can do all kind of kingdom work. Or they could also perhaps think that, well, even if we are married, you know, that kind of takes our time if we should stop kind of being married, and we can devote ourselves more fully to the Lord. All very pious-sounding reasoning, but even further, someone could say, if you get married, that's going to bring you other difficulties in life, so, so don't get married at all. But the reality is we are not yet in the new heaven and new earth, where indeed there will be no marriage anymore. We'll still be male and female, but we don't have marriage, don't have that aspect of life anymore. And in this life, on this side of our Lord's coming, the single life can bring its temptations. And therefore, Paul says it is better to marry so that the sexual desires, which in the end are still normal. That's how God made man. They are normal, that these desires can find their proper avenue, can prop, find their proper garden, you could say, in which to grow. Now, indeed, it's true. Some may have the gift for remaining single, and there are brothers and sisters who, under God's providence, never find a partner, or by God's providence, they have become a widow or a widower, and so though they are single, well, also in those cases, it is always important to ask the Lord for strength to remain faithful, to stay pure. So, those are situations, but the general principle is it is better to marry than to be burning with passion. That's compassionate counsel. Now, in the third place, and this applies in the marriage situation, again, thinking of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, husbands and wives should not deny one another except by common agreement for a definite period, perhaps for a time of prayer. Now, you see, the Apostle Paul is, is sober enough to know that, that perhaps husband and wife who might have a spiritual high moment to think, okay, we're, we're not going to do that part of life anymore. Well, that if you do that, you forget that you're human. You forget how God made you as a human being, as a male and a female. And if you, if you do that in a kind of an indefinite way for an unreasonable amount of time, this is going to bring temptation to start looking for things outside of marriage. Never justifies it, never. Doesn't justify adultery to satisfy sexual desires, but temptations, sexual temptations are a reality in a fallen world. So again, you see, Paul, himself never married, but an inspired apostle of the Lord, is a servant also to give God's compassionate counsel about these matters. Don't deny who we are as human beings. That's how God made us. Yes, there are temptations. We are affected by sin. That doesn't take away from the fact that we are sexual beings. That's how God has created us. In the fourth place, and now we can think again of the book of Proverbs, it's important to stay Fo focused positively on one's spouse, and take to heart that call to delight in each other. For as the author of Proverbs counsels his son, or could even be a teacher-student relationship, he says, why should you be intoxicated by an adulteress, by a wayward woman? You know, in this way, we can recall how, how the marriage relationship in Scripture is compared to the relationship between God and His people. And we know in that relationship there is to be a total dedication to each other. We are to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to have no other gods before Him because God is totally de dedicated to us. Well, within a marriage bond, a husband and wife are to be totally dedicated and devoted to one another. For a husband, there is really only to be one woman on his mind 
in his heart only one soul mate, namely his wife. And for the wife, there is only to be one man on her mind and in her heart, and only one soul mate, namely her husband. You see, that then also temptation has less opportunity. Now, these kind of things tend to be there when, when a couple gets married. All they can think about is each other. You know, and then the first few years, it's all about each other. Yes, all great, but then time sets in. So it requires effort on the parties in the marriage to let this continue beyond the honeymoon. Because if there is not that dedication to each other, that commitment which is made every time a couple in, in the marriage vows to be true to each other always, if that commitment is not there, it is not actively embraced, you could say every morning again that the husband says in his, wife, to his, in his heart, I love my wife. And the wife says, I love my husband. Might not say it out loud. It's good to say it out loud too, by the way, but to say it within their heart and to be committed to that has to continue throughout one's life, you know, because temptations to sexual sin can come any time. Think of David, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, one blotch on his record, the sin with respect to Uriah, whom he had killed, whom, who, and his wife he took, adultery with Bathsheba. You know, the mind can begin to wander, not just for young men, middle-aged men, old men, Sexual temptations are always there. In that sense, we also do well to remember the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, in a general exhortation. He says, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And fifth, there is the a practical counsel given by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. And he says, chapter 5, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is fitting among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. It's quite strong. It not even be mentioned among you. In connection with this, we can also think of, of his words, slightly different context. He was addressing false ideas about the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, but he has that statement, bad company ruins good morals. Would be a good guideline in terms of whom we seek out as friends. If, if there's one that we want to be a friend with, maybe teenagers want to be friends, they want to belong to someone, but the person is always having crude jokes, derogatory about the opposite sex. Not a good friend at all. Bad company ruins good morals. Important to keep in mind in terms of what the music that we listen to. What is it about? Is it about purity or is it about immorality? What kind of movies we watch. You have to ask ourselves, is that not really going to help me get a better appreciation of sexuality and of marriage as God wants it? Also in that respect, you know, we, we have to think of the whole climate again where every immorality is normalized. Think of that frog in the pot again. And then there are those penetrating words of our Lord Jesus after He pointed out how even looking at a woman with lustful intent constitutes adultery. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. That, that sounds like a pretty extreme treatment for temptation. But we should, we should also hear our Good Shepherd thinking about the well-being of His sheep, realizing how the good gifts can be spoiled and how the temptations can be so strong. So, we may not come into an extreme situation like that, but, but you know, if you think about the sins of the eye, looking lustfully, we think of all the pornography available on the Internet and how it can happen. Even when, when you're Googling for information, you type in something a little bit wrong. You didn't mean to, but, but because you made a little typo, you get a whole list of things that only one more click and it would take you to very immoral life, uh, websites. Do, do we then also say, okay, I better get away from here fast. Do we run away 
Or is it the case even that, that it becomes the point that we might not have to cut off our arm, but maybe we should cut off our internet because that is such a big problem. We can't resist the temptations. Well, it is better to go into heaven without internet than to go into the internet into hell. And so, brothers and sisters, as we deal with these things, I recognize that may come across as a little bit of moralizing, maybe a bit more than a little bit. Don't forget, however, that we are busy with listening to the voice of our Heavenly Father. He is speaking to those whom He has redeemed by the precious blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He is renewing by the Holy Spirit. And as He is renewing us, He's to the point. And He points out the many and varied forms of sexual temptations, not, not to condemn us, no, we're sitting here as His children, but to, to teach us. He shows that he, he knows the great dangers. That's why He wastes no words and gets to the point. And He shows us how the way of the kingdom really is antithetical to the way of the nations. And He shows it to us who have been granted liberty in Christ, our Savior, the Savior who also saves us from sexual sins. It's important to also keep that in mind. You know that, that it might be as we sit here listening and then we are reminded of all the shortcomings and weaknesses. Jesus Christ could have that woman caught in adultery. He could say to her, I do not condemn you. Go home and sin no more. That's the kind of savior we have because also when it comes to sexual sins, he says, charge them to my account like he did for David's sin. That always gives us hope also when we struggle, when we stumble. And as we reflect on that, perhaps it is best also then to, to finish with, you could say, a prayer. May the Holy Spirit grant us all strength to live in sexual purity so that we might live joyfully in our new liberty from bondage to Satan and sin to His glory for our assurance and our neighbor's benefit. Amen.